Hello and welcome to Surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. We have with us today Jefferson Hawkins, author of Counterfeit Dreams. Jeff, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Jeff, I read Counterfeit Dreams. It's a magnificent book, very heartfelt, and uh, I think it's one of the best books out there. I highly recommend it to people who have not read it. It's one man's journey into an out-of-the-world of Scientology. And Jeff, on today's show, I wanted to ask you, you know, go back to 1982, you're uh, an executive in the Church of Scientology, and L. Ron Hubbard himself sends down orders to launch a book campaign to put Dianetics back at the top of the bestseller list. Yeah. What do you do when you yeah, What do you do when you get that kind of order from the man himself? Well, the order actually wasn't to me; it was to the executive strata. Uh, but they weren't about to do anything, uh, ab- you know, really anything about it. Um, so I was in the middle of a project at the, at that point. Uh, which was to find uh, a public relations firm that would be willing to take on the church's PR, which was horrible at the time. Uh, that hasn't changed. Uh, but in the in the con- in the context of that time, to, just to bring readers or our listeners up to speed, the church had gone through Operation Snow White, where Mary Sue Hubbard and eleven uh, other Scientologists had gone to prison. Yeah, yeah. And so the executives feel that you need a PR firm to help make the church look better. Uh, how does that work? I mean, how would a, an actual uh, non-Scientology PR firm, what were some of the proposals? Well, you know, I, all I was doing was screening the firms. This was uh, when the Guardian's office was being disbanded. And so there was a bit of a vacuum there, and they wanted um, to, to kind of fill the PR vacuum with some actions by a PR firm. But it never got to that stage. The whole project was dropped um, before I even finished the project. Um, but that was kind of the, the way things were going at that time. Um, the Guardian's office was being disbanded, and they were looking at ways to sort of handle the church's PR. But Hubbard said, you know, basically, let's get out there and do a big book campaign and get get people in, which I could get behind. I wasn't in the geo or anything like that. I was in the marketing area. And so I I set up a petition to actually launch a professional uh, book campaign for Dianetics. And and that was approved. And we spent about six months doing nothing but market research into publics and media and doing a lot of surveys and figuring stuff out. And uh, and eventually we put together quite a, a large, quite a professional campaign and a large campaign, uh, which involved uh, placing television advertising for Dianetics. At that point, we were running it in, uh, I think, about 10 major markets. We started, and within a, a few weeks, we had gotten Dianetics onto the bestseller list of a couple of the major book chains at the time. Um, Walden Books was very big. Walden Books and B. Dalton Bookseller were the two biggest book chains at the time. <clears throat> and we got onto their bestseller list within a matter, a matter of weeks. Jeff, that's impressive. What, you know, just in terms of selling books, what were the kind of things in the survey that you, that you used to uh, convince the public that they should buy a copy of this book and use it? Well, one of the things that we did, <clears throat> which the church had never done before, is we figured out who they should be promoting to. And because, uh, and I'm sure it's still true, but at that time, I discovered that only about 11% of the U.S. population read more than one book in a year. Uh, So we were not talking about a broad mass campaign. We were narrowing it down to a finite audience. And the the audience that bought... um, nonfiction books was even smaller and the audience that bought self-help books was smaller than that and we were eventually able to to figure out a very narrow demographic profile of the people that we should be um, promoting to and the campaign was then launched very tightly targeting that demographic it's what they call nowadays niche marketing uh, we were just going for a very, very narrow target audience, and that was what um, that, that was what generated the book sales at that point. You know. Now, was the the point of the campaign to get new people to 
uh, join the church as publics and take courses, receive auditing? Sure, sure. It, it was just uh, the main push was to sell a lot of books, and then each book had uh, a card in it, a return card in it for more information. And we found that uh, I think it was about 5% of book buyers returned the card. Uh, so if you were selling, you know, a cons- you know, 30,000 books a week, which we got up to eventually, uh, that was a significant, uh, s- significant number of people that were sending in those cards. And we found that when those people were called um, and contacted, however they were contacted, that they were pretty hot. They were pretty interested. And I was told at the time by uh, a lot of the orgs that that was their number one feeder line uh, for new people was uh, 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 names coming in on those more information cards. Now, the statistics uh, you've described in your writings uh, online, the statistics uh, of Scientology went up due to the uh, due to the book selling campaign. Yeah, correct. Was that the highest that the church had ever reached in the 80s, or when do you see the apogee of Scientology's uh, membership? Well, here's what happened. We started this campaign in 82. Uh, after a couple of years, you began to see the the result in the statistics, and there was a steady, dramatic rise in Scientology statistics from about 80, I'd say about 85 to, to 1991. By 1990, the campaign was being cut and sabotaged through mostly senior executive actions against the campaign, coming from David Miscavige. And, and that's that's very interesting. Why would uh, David Miscavige uh, defund a very successful marketing campaign? Well, uh, and that's an interesting point. But just to finish the point on statistics. The, the church's statistics went up until 1991, and at that point the campaign had, was defunct. It was no more, uh, and I had been removed from post, et cetera, et cetera. 1991, to, the, to the, the statistics of Scientology, income, people in, everything, just went on a death slide. It just went down and down and down and down and down, and by the time I left in 2005, they were still going down. So 1991 was the high point of the church, and they have not, you know, they have not exceeded that, despite their claims. And 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 this was, uh, you know, this speaks to David Miscavige's uh, leadership style. You have a successful campaign, but compare and contrast, if you will, for our listeners, the leadership style of L. Ron Hubbard with David Miscavige. What are the two different? things you see, similarities, differences? Well, uh, there, are, yeah, there are some similarities. I think the main difference is that, that Hubbard was uh, a marketing guy. He knew how to get people to hand over their money, basically. And he, uh, he, had, he had worked out a whole pattern for Dianetics and Scientology, which was basically to you know, have these levels and these breakthroughs that just go on and on and on. And he was he was fine on getting a lot of new people in and, uh, you know, spending the time and the money to, to broadly promote and get new people. And he understood. I think he was just a, a good instinctual marketing guy. He understood that in order to have a lot of people to hit up for courses and auditing, you had to have, you had to open the the front gates and just bring a lot of people in. Uh, Miscavige never understood that at all. All he wanted was a sort of a small captive group of people that he could completely control. And I think one of his major objections to these big public campaigns is that they brought in uh, a lot of new people and new people are messy. They have to be trained. They have to be, you know, indoctrinated into the system, you know, they, and they ask a lot of questions and they, you know, this and that, and it's just very, very messy and it's very expensive to, to, to get a lot of new people in. It pays off down the line when they sign up for courses. Well, Miscavige never understood that. He only saw the initial expense uh, that they cost to, to, to create these names and he saw the chaos that they created 
And he didn't want any part of that. He just wanted a nice, quiet, compliant, closed group of Scientologists that he could uh, he could control, basically, uh, which is what he has. Uh, he has a shrinking group of, of core followers, uh, but they are, they're, they're making no public inroads right now. That's uh, a fascinating observation. And really, when you look at a business, and that's what I think the Church of Scientology fundamentally is, is a business, there's two different models. You can make a lot of money through volume, selling millions of something. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you can sell millions of inexpensive automobiles, say a Ford Fiesta, something like that. Yeah. Uh, or you can sell, you know, 5,000 Lamborghinis. Mm-hmm. And would you say that the drift over time in the church has been to become fewer people who are buying more expensive goods and services? Oh, definitely, definitely, yeah. What was the – so if the book campaign ended because Miscavige basically wants to shut down the flow of what Hubbard called bodies in the shop, raw meat, whatever you want to call it, yeah. uh, then you begin to focus on your group. So – the Dianetis campaign ends, and it's sort of coincident with uh, tax exemption and the rise of the IAS. Uh, mm-hmm. What happens after the book campaign? Uh, is it is it the narrative uh, tax exemption and then the golden age of tech one in 1996? Well, yeah. What uh, what marketing swung over to at that point? It swung away from big public campaigns and onto. <laughs> Uh, sort of a continual process of repackaging and reissuing the existing materials, which is something that's still going on. And so sell the sell the public the same things over and over, over and over and over again because with no new people coming in, they only had this captive audience of uh, current members. So and they knew that if they repackaged the books, which they did in 1991. Uh, that they could get everybody to buy all the books again. So that was what was done, and and Miscavige made the announcement at that time, this is 1991, that these books were 100% on source, and all of the off-source things had been found and eliminated, and it was now the time to get your 100% on source library. Well, then, of course, he said the exact same thing with the basics release, uh, all these are now completely on source, and all the off source things have been eliminated, and everybody once again had to buy all the materials. And I'm sure, you know, five years down the line, they're going to repackage them all again and say that, okay, now all of the, you know, uh, off source things have been eliminated. But it's just a continuing process of repackaging, repackaging, repackaging the same material. Sure, and as long as you have SP transcriptionists, that'll continue ad infinitum. Uh, and, you know, the uh, while this is going on, the 1991 launch of the new, you know, 100% on source materials, is this when Miscavige begins his series of annual events to, to sell to a smaller audience? Because at some point, he begins doing events and they get bigger and bigger and bigger, or, you know, in, in terms of not attendance, but in terms of stage sets, drama, music. Yeah, yeah, that, that whole thing started in the 1980s, really. And then it grew, and pretty soon there were, I think, six major events every year. Uh, and, and, and new, new material, quote unquote, new materials being released at these events. And so that became the major focus of international management and uh, Golden Era Studios. Um, The film production essentially stopped. They were just totally doing nothing but events. And the whole life life on the base became centered around these six events. And that's all that was happening. Now, that's interesting. So you now are in what's called Int Base or the International Base in uh, San Jacinto, uh, Gilman Hot Springs, Mm -hmm. and the whole base is orchestrated around event production. Mm -hmm. Did you, I mean, was there any time for spiritual enlightenment, auditing, or was it pretty much production all the time every day? It it was production pretty much around the clock, a lot of all-nighters. Very few people were getting any auditing of any kind. Yeah. Well, what was a what was a routine day for you in the '90s at Ant Base? Is it uh, just your production target every day? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, very much so. 
<clears throat> yeah, it was just constant emergencies. Everything was an emergency. Everything was late. Everything had to be done now, 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 now. And it's uh, that's one of the ways that the people at the end base are controlled. It's a continual, continual state of emergency. And all the he... all-nighters, no sleep, on and on and on, you know. You know, there's a saying online, uh, it's an old business saying, poor planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on my part. <laughs> and uh, th that used to be a, a little thing you'd sip on walls in offices uh, way back when. I'm sure it's still out there. Is Do you think it's poor planning on the part of David Miscavige or simply manipulation that is using time pressure and, and false emergency to make people produce? Well, yeah, I think there's a, I think there's a lot of that that goes on. Um, certainly, you know, if somebody sane were in charge, I think that they would back off of that and start to look at some long-term goals and some long-term planning. But there's never any time for long-term planning at the end base. And part of it's miscavige. Yes, he does like to drive people to their limits. But it's, it was also built in by Hubbard, you know, with these week-to-week Thursday, two o'clock statistic mentality. Nobody's thinking about next week's, you know, statistics. They're thinking about this week's statistics and particularly income. Uh, and all that was put in place by Hubbard. You know, this, that, that's old, old, old Scientology procedure. Oh, certainly in, in the uh, in the 19 early 1960s, there's an author named uh, Les Danes. And he wrote a book uh, basically on high-pressure sales, how to close. Yeah, and that was the Bible of Regis. High-pressure sales. Yeah. And, uh, and now this is interesting because these are two unlike things. Spiritual enlightenment and high-pressure sales are two unlike things. <laughs> yeah. And yet in, in the in spirit of uh, American hucksterism, yeah. they were mated. And, and I think that's one of the central problems of the church – statistics and enlightenment don't go together if you're out to make money in a business why then go make money and you need statistics and you need long-term management not just day to day mm -hmm. uh, and if you're out to be enlightened enlightenment takes however long enlightenment takes and that's one of the rules of maybe spiritual enlightenment it's going to take however long it takes right and if you're running a business that's quite different and so when L. Ron Hubbard merged the two, you have somewhat of an inherent uh, recipe for disaster. Right. You can have a lot of human suffering occur because you're pushing people to make money every Thursday at 2 p.m. What kind of stresses did you feel having to have your statistics every Thursday at 2 p.m.? Well, you know, your entire life is hinging on those statistics. Um, uh, if your stats are not up, you can start. You can get denied things. And at the base, they had what was called the team share system, and you were issued a series of five cards. And if your statistics were down, or if you were in disfavor, you would lose your cards. And for instance, there was a uh, uh, well, there was a, a social card, and when you lost that, you couldn't go to any events, and you couldn't have any liberties or anything like that. You just had to work. Uh, and then you could lose your uh, bonus card, which meant you would not receive any bonuses. Not that they ever paid any, but should they pay bonuses, you couldn't receive them without your bonus card. Then there was a pay card, and when you lost your pay card, you didn't get paid. And then there was a food card, and when you lost your food card, you had to eat rice and beans. And then there was a birthing card, and when you lost that, you had to sleep on the floor of your office or you know, out on the grass or wherever you could find. You know, so literally, your 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 life hinged on those weekly statistics. That's just insane, and and yet you feel that you are trying to make a difference in the world somehow, and you work despite these handicaps and obstacles. When you uh, interacted with David Miscavige, what's your experience of the man? He's completely narcissistic. He is the center of the universe. Everything revolves around him. Uh, and he is, uh, I consider him to be sociopathic. He uh, operates at, a, at the level of threat and punishment and, and physical violence. That's his nature. He is not a nice person. Um, and I think anybody who has dealt directly with him can confirm that. Uh, he gets physically violent. 
He has been known many times to beat people up. Uh, but even despite that, his daily discourse is just full of threats and screaming and yelling and obscenities and uh, degradation, attacking people. That's how he gets through life and, and uh, or, or doesn't get through life. And you cannot you cannot um, stand up to that or you will just get offloaded and declared a suppressive person. You have to go along with whatever he is. Uh, he's doing. Did David Miscavige ever hit you? Yeah, yeah. As I've detailed in my book, I think it was five separate occasions he uh, physically attacked me. Can you describe that for our listeners? Sure. I'll describe maybe the most dramatic one. Uh, I was called up to a meeting. I had uh, This was years after the Dianex campaign. In fact, it was 2002. And I had been um, asked to write an infomercial about Dianetics, which I had done twice before. Uh, to pretty good success, we'd sold about 40,000 of the Dynex kits, which included audio, video, the book, um, all that stuff. You know, it was a package. And, uh, I think it was 1995, and I sold about 40,000 of those. So I was asked to do another infomercial, which I did, and I worked with some professional infomercial people, and I uh, had them critique it, and you know, did this whole script up, sent it up to David Miscavige. He called me into this meeting. And he just and he was just making fun of this script that I had written. And then I said, well, sir, if I can just explain, you know, the rationale behind this. And he said, I don't want to hear a thing from you. I just want to hear your your overts and withholds. That's all I want to hear from you. And he, and he goes on and on like this. He wouldn't let me talk. And I would say, uh, but sir, if I could just explain, he'd say, you see how he talks to me? You see how he talks to me? You know, like I was supposedly being completely disrespectful by attempting to, you know, give some of the rationale behind his script. So you're not you're not alone with him. He has an entourage. There was forty. Yeah, was that, there was forty international executives in that room. Huge. And you're the you're, so you're the you're the, you're singled out as the subject of ridicule. Yeah, yeah. And and then he starts going. Look at how he looks at me. Look at how he looks at me. And everybody said, "Tell him stop looking at him." I wasn't looking at him like anything except. <laughs> Maybe some of my contempt was showing through. But uh, and then all of a sudden, no warning, he jumps up on the conference room table, leaps across it and slams me against uh, one of the partition walls, beats me in the face and knocks me to the ground. And my shirt was torn half off. The buttons were flying everywhere. Um and my legs ended up tangled in his legs because he had, you know, basically just knocked me right over. And he said, let go of my legs. And I did. And, and I was totally freaked because I had heard nothing about David Miscavige beating anyone. This was my first experience with that. And I, I, I didn't know this happened. I had no preparation for this whatsoever. So I was in shock. And all these executives, and then he stormed out of the room, and all these executives were sitting there. And they were saying, get up, get up. Uh, you don't want to make him wrong. In other words, that was their total concern, is that I should upset him by continuing to lay on the ground. <laughs> Jeff, that is just shocking. You, you have someone who positions himself as a global ecclesiastical leader, and suddenly he's beating you. Yeah. He's in a, a fury or a hysteria or rage, and... Out in uh, corporate life, this would be assault and battery. I can tell you from my corporate experience, if this ever, I had never seen anything, uh, any physical violence. That never didn't happen in the workplace I was in. It, it happens, but it never happened around me. Mm -hmm. And I was in some intense corporate meetings, but decorum was always expected and demanded. You could raise your voice and be fired, literally, for you know, for misconduct. So to me, as, a, as someone who's been in corporate life, it's shocking what you describe in the workplace. And it is workplace violence, and you are a victim. Mm -hmm. And yet you're told by your colleagues, don't make COB wrong. Yeah. yeah. So, you're, you're not treated as the victim. You're treated as the perpetrator. In other words, what did, what did you do to make him angry? So you're, you're – he – David Miscavige leaves the room. You've just been assaulted. Mm-hmm. You have, you have no re recourse. You cannot call the police. 
No. You can't file charges. You have to just kind of what? Take one for the team. I mean, what, what's the what's the aftermath of being beaten? Yeah, well, by David you, you're you're taken off post and you're put into security checking to find out your crimes. This is a, I want to stop it here for a minute, Jeff. This is this is what I think people don't understand when you're in this kind of uh, system. You've just been beaten by David Miscavige, and suddenly you're put into security checking or interrogation to find out what you did to set him off. Exactly. Exactly. This is this is you, you could be in Soviet Russia. I know. It's like it's like Orwell. It's like 1984. You know. This certainly. So you're being interrogated uh, for your crimes on David Miscavige. This had to start causing cognitive dissonance, a break in your reality. Did you ask yourself, "What am I doing here? Should I get out?" Um, I would say that was the beginning of my long journey out of Scientology. That was the moment at which I started to realize, well, a couple of things. Number one, that this was not the group that I joined and that it, it, it had become something evil. But even more important than that, I had always, you know, because I had run across strange uh, things and abusive things in Scientology for years. But I always thought, well, yeah, there's bad apples in any group, but the good people will take care of them and they will leave and things will go back to normal and things will be good. Um, and uh, you know, in other words, time will, will take care of this and these people will leave. Well, by the time I was beaten up by Miscavige, I realized this wasn't going to change and he was not going to leave. And if anybody was going to uh, leave, it was going to be me, you know, because Scientology was permanently, permanently corrupted to the point where See, it, it, it was uh, it, it, it could, couldn't go back. It couldn't be reformed at that point. Well, no, certainly the, a culture can become so toxic as to be beyond repair or remedy. And when a, someone violent and is in a position of power, it can only get worse. It will never get better. Yeah, exactly. For the simple reason that people with violent tendencies don't get better. And uh, when you interfaced with, with David Miscavige after he beat you, were you supposed to pretend that nothing had ever happened? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. And then there was other incidents where he assaulted you. Yeah, then there was four more times that he assaulted me, and uh, and I witnessed him assaulting others as well. And it just became a part of the daily life. You went into a meeting not knowing whether you were going to get beat up or not, you know. And that's a uh, you know a considerable level of fear to live in, you know. Well, well, certainly because you're you're operating under duress. You're trying to live under duress with someone who's unpredictable and violent. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I know from corporate life there were unpredictable senior officials, vice presidents. But they were, you know, you would, you would call them maybe, <clears throat> you'd say he or she's hot-headed, temperamental. Yeah, yeah. But they, they, knew, they clearly knew, senior corporate officials clearly knew where the line was. And not only did they not want to cross it, they never would. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, to compare and contrast things, uh, we would have what's called a word of prayer behind a closed door with someone who got out of line. You better knock it off. This is your last and final warning. Sure. You, you do not behave like this in this corporation. We value our people. And this is an interesting point to me, Jeff. In corporate life, we pay to find the best talent and to retain them, keep them happy. It was, you know, paying a competitive salary, competitive or better, Mm -hmm. 401k, company car, benefits, you know, stock, things like that. So corporate uh, officials want to keep their best people, keep them happy. And even though you're going to work them hard, there is it's very can be very profitable to work for a corporation to have a position. And I know that it, it can be very good to be in a top corporate position. Sure. Scien Scientology, on the other hand, they waste their best people. This is what is insane. They waste people like you who are talented, who can sell books, who can deliver results. Doesn't it ever occur to Scientology publics, I ask myself, that David Miscavige is wasting the top talent and he hasn't prepared another generation when he goes? Uh, totally, 
Totally. He ha he has gotten rid of anybody at that int base that had any initiative or talent or spark. Uh, and I could just go down the list, you know, everybody, Steve Hall, and, um, uh, you know, Mike Render, all of, you could just go down the list of people that have been gotten rid of, and they were the, the most talented and, and brightest people at the base. So when, when you, uh, you eventually routed out of Sea Org at 2002, was it? 2005. 2005. Yeah, what was your process of routing out? I had to go through about three months of sec checks. Uh, and I was out at the, uh, there's an area of the int base called the uh, Old Gilman House. And it's a, a, a swamp area uh, and an old, the original old house that was on that property. And it's uh, in, within a fenced enclosure. I mean, the whole base is enclosed with razor wire fences. But this section of the base is then fenced off again from the rest of the base, and it's where the the offloadees are are kept, or anybody that's that needs to be separated from the crew is kept out there. All the bad apples, you know, are kept out in this area. So I was out there for three months, getting um, security checks, mostly on, um, you know, have you had critical thoughts about David Miscavige, and just auditing on and on and on about David Miscavige and so forth. And eventually I got to the point where I could, you know, make the needle float, which a lot of people have learned how to do. And a lot of people in Scientology know how to do that. Um, and, and, and just say, oh, no, he's fine. He's great. He's wonderful. And only at that point was I allowed to go. You know? So you leave, you leave at base. How many years were you in the C organization? About 35 years. And when you finally leave Imp Base that day, what's your severance package? What do they give you for 35 years of dedicated service? <laughs> uh, the severance is $500, which I only found out when I left, which doesn't even uh, – it, it, it gets you nothing. You, know, you, can't even, you can't even, you know, find a motel for a week for $500, you know. So you're, you're off the base. Did you have a car? Did you drive away? Or how do you – actually leave the base once they go say okay you can go I had a car I mean I was luckier than most because I had had a family inheritance so I had a little bit of money not much but enough to get by for a couple of months and you know pay rent and you know find a house and so forth so I was on on the clock to find a job and to find a place to live and all that luckily I had enough money to finance that a lot of People that leave the Sea Org have nothing, and they're not able to do that. Now, I've read your book, Counterfeit Dreams. Is this the point at which you, you go from uh, Gilman Hot Springs to Santa Barbara? Yes, that's right. To start over, and you you uh, got a job working for a fellow? Yeah, uh, working for a – it was a, a weekly magazine uh, that was put out there in Santa Barbara that has to do with real estate, entertainment, movies, art, that sort of thing. Now, Jeff, what I found interesting in Counterfeit Dreams, you mentioned how your uh, employer had to tell you that you didn't need to work seven days a week or 16 hours a day. <laughs> he had he had to kind of um, to tone me down a bit. I mean, I, I knew that they only worked uh, five days a week, but it still came as a shock the first weekend that I had. And I realized that I had two days and I didn't have to do anything. And that was amazing to me. Yeah. Well, what did you do that first weekend? I, I, I think I went for a hike. Yeah. Um, it, just walked around. It was so great. You know, I went to the museums, and you know, I just uh, uh, it was so fantastic to have free time. Did you feel like someone who had been in prison? Yeah, very much so. The only difference is that they treat people better in prison. Point well taken. They they do uh, prisoners can sue. They can have a, a lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, they have they have recourse and uh, Sea Org members do not. Yeah, yeah. And uh, did you speak in reading the internet once you left the uh, base? I did, I did, um, uh, and I spent quite a long time just searching on the internet for information about Scientology, and uh, you know read read all the books that you read when you're when you're coming out. You know, Peace of Blue Sky and uh, Madman or Messiah, all those books. 
What were the two or three things that really stood out on your mind that you discovered on the Internet when you left? Well, um, one was that Hubbard had lied about his life, um, which really upset me because this was a man that for 35 years I had respected and revered. Um, and to discover after I had gotten out that he had lied about key facts of his life was, uh, to me, that was really, really a betrayal. Um, yeah, it would be an outrageous betrayal. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing is I was trying to find out what I could about David Miscavige's background because I knew nothing about the man. Um, and here he, here he was head of Scientology and nobody elected him. Nobody appointed him. He just grabbed the position. And I was able to find a lot of information online, and I also connected up with, I started connecting up with other ex-Scientologists, and I found some people who had worked with him, and I was able to fill in a lot of the details about his rise to power, you know, a lot of which is in, in um, you know, Larry Wright's book and Janice Re Janet Reitman's book. Now, you around this time, you began your blog, Counterfeit Dreams, which preceded the actual book. Mm -hmm. And this was um, – when, when I remember reading it, when you came online, you became a subject of interest to, to many of us who were what are called old guard critics. Yeah. Because you, you write with such an authoritative voice and a lot of compassion. It's very heartfelt. Um, what did – how did your blog turn into a book? Well, you know, I, I – I had some friends in Santa Barbara at the time, and I would try to explain my experiences to them. And it was very hard because I would tell them about some of the atrocities, and they would say, well, why didn't you just call the police? Why didn't you leave? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then I would try to explain that, and it just got, it was very hard to, to explain the whole story in bits and pieces because it always generates more questions than you have answers. So I, I thought, okay, I got to write the whole story down from beginning to end. It's the only way anybody's going to understand what happened to me, because if I try to tell it in bits and pieces, it's not comprehensible. Nobody can understand. Why did you put up with that? Why did you stay so long? You know? So I decided I got to write the whole thing. And it was hard for me to, I first had to make enough sense of it myself to get some perspective on it, to be able to write about it. And it took me, I think it was three years, I think it was 2008, before I was able to write anything, um, you know, that made any sense at all. And the first thing I wrote was the opening chapter, and it was just painful to write. Uh, and I was just in tears as I was trying to write this thing. But the whole thing was very, very therapeutic. And I thought, I'll, I'll just publish it as a blog. And that also... Um, encouraged me to continue and finish it because people were going, well, where's the next chapter? Where's the next chapter? <laughs> so there was a lot of, you know, demand on me to finish writing the thing. So I did. And then I had a lot of people saying, well, that, you've got to publish that as a book. And so I eventually went back and added about probably about 50% more material, a lot of explanatory material, a lot of background, a lot of details that I had left out and added the, that all in and then published it as a hardback and eventually as an e-book. I'm certainly glad you did, and you, you've spoken out on other occasions. I, I remember at the uh, press conference uh, held at the Steve Allen Center for Media Inquiry here in Hollywood, uh, you did a, an outstanding job leading that press conference, mm. and uh, as well as being on uh, CNN. Have you ever had any uh, retaliation from the Office of Special Affairs for speaking out? Well, you know, they've tried to discredit me. And, you know, every time I do a media show, they will send a long letter um, to, the, to the media saying what, what a horrible person I am and so forth and so on. Um, beyond that, no, nobody's ever followed me that I know. I mean, I'm just I'm way up here in Oregon and I have never seen anybody follow me or any of that sort of thing, and I haven't been aware of any dirty tricks. I think they've kind of left me alone. Um, and one of the reasons, you know, I, I've always believed this, that one of the reasons the church leaves me alone is I wrote the whole thing down. You know, I wrote the whole story down. 
And that's hard for them to counter because I'm telling the truth. It's also hard for them to take any kind of legal action against me because A, I'm telling the truth, and B, uh, if they were to take me to court, the first witness I'd call would be David Miscavige, and they know that. You know, so they're not going to touch me because they know that what I wrote is true, basically. Yes, and, and that's exactly true. The church does not want to have COB, RTC, David Miscavige deposed in any legal proceeding. Jeff, your, your latest book is entitled Leaving Scientology, A Practical Guide to Escape and Recovery. Give our listeners a sense of the book. Well, this, again, this started out as a blog. And I decided that I wanted to have a sort of an ongoing conversation with other ex-Scientologists. And so I started this blog called Leaving Scientology. And uh, I was writing a post, I guess, every couple of days uh, and taking up things that I had learned, like um, uh, mind control techniques, thought stopping, um, all of the tricks of mind control. I would take them up one by one and explain how Scientology did that. And also at the time, I uh, I was in touch with a lot of people who are who were still involved with the church, and they were feeding me in, inside information. So there was a lot of sort of inside, kind of what Mike Rinder's doing now. There was a lot of kind of inside information on leaks that were going on. So part of it was kind of deconstructing the church's mind control system, and part of it was uh, kind of debunking their ongoing PR efforts. You know, so it was both of those things. And this went on. I, I, I ran that blog for two years and had some really, really good conversations, online conversations with a lot of people who were following the blog. And then, you know, one day I said, well, I'm done with that because I think at some point you have to walk away from Scientology. And, uh, and I decided, well, I have other, many other things to do, and I don't want to, my life to be dictated by Scientology, either pro or con. You know, I have much more interesting things that I want to do. So I, you know, stopped doing the blog. But then I, I took um, uh, a cut, probably a couple dozen of the most popular articles and turned those into book chapters and then published that as, a, as an e-book. And that book, again, is Leaving Scientology, A Practical Guide to Escape and Recovery. I've read it. It's fascinating. It's available on Amazon and a Kindle download. Uh, and Certainly anyone who's been through the experience and is looking to recover from the Scientology experience, that's one of the books they want to read. Uh, Jeff, always a, a pleasure to talk to you. I want to have you on the show again. Sure. Thank you for coming. No problem. Jeff, as a parting shot, Let's say we have someone listening who's still in the Church of Scientology, Sea Org or Public. What do you have to say to them? Well, I would say this. I would say that, you know, I don't have to tell them that there is something wrong with the church. Anybody who is in Scientology these days or who's on staff knows that there are things wrong with the church. Um, and the only question really is, do they want to face up to those things and be honest about them, or do they want to uh, run away and justify them and avoid them? And I would hope that more and more Scientologists would take an honest look at what is really wrong with their church um, and then make a decision whether they want to be a part of that or not. It's not the church that most of us joined. It's a different breed and it's uh, it's abusive and in my mind it's evil and I think that any thinking person who honestly looks at what the church has become would uh, would make the choice to leave it very strong words from Jefferson Hawkins Jeff thank you for being on the show well, thank you for having me and for surviving Scientology radio this is Jeffrey Augustine we'll be in very good touch <laughs>